Welcome to Dangerous Wisdom, a journey into mystery and a gateway to the mind of nature and the nature of mind. This is Dr. Nico, your friendly neighborhood soul doctor, happy to be here with you so that together we can create a culture of wisdom, love, and beauty. My friends, I am delighted to bring you a little bit of paradox, literally a pair of docs, a couple of soul doctors today. I have Dr. Leslie Ellis with us, and I will have to put on my spectacles to be able to read her bio properly for you. So Dr. Leslie Ellis is a leading expert in the use of experiential and somatic approaches in psychotherapy, in particular for working with dreams and nightmares. She is the author of A Clinician's Guide to Dream Therapy. She has a PhD in clinical psychology and worked as a therapist in private practice in Vancouver. Whew, what a delightful place. Vancouver, British Columbia for more than 25 years. She is a certifying coordinator and former president of the International Focusing Institute. And she incorporates this gentle yet profound method of internal inquiry into her method of engaging with dreams. Leslie now offers dream study programs online, certifying clinicians in her unique method of embodied experiential dream work. She also teaches with the Jung Platform and the Polyvagal Institute. And a little uh, heads up for those of you who might be interested in learning about dreams, her book is a wonderful resource. It's, it's short and uh, easy to read. It's very well written, clearly written. It is from Rutledge, and I always have a little bit of, uh, it's not her fault that Rutledge is this way. I feel like they might be the most expensive academic publisher. So it's not a $20 book, but it is a book very much worthwhile. And it's not uh, its not one of their $100 books either, thank goodness. Um, its But it's a little more than you might expect for a slim volume, if those of you who are, uh, might have sticker shock. But let me say, it is so worth it. It's a really good book. And I'm so delighted to have Leslie here to talk about dreams and who knows what. Dr. Leslie, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and speak with you. Yeah. Well, so shall we start with dreams? Does that sound like a nice place? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, you begin your book with a really wonderful question. That is, why Why should we bother? And you note that this is still somewhat marginalized in therapeutic practice. So if people were interested in talking to their therapist about dreams, they might find some hesitation or um, you know, maybe put off to somebody else. That's not my field. Can you talk about why dreams and why, why, why this marginalization? Ah, well, those are two big questions, different questions. Yes. Um, I'll start with the marginalization because that's easier. Um, it, you know, it it's the reason that I wrote the book and why I teach clinicians about dreams is because uh, they they were really a, the central a part of psychotherapeutic practice when this whole enterprise began with Freud and Jung. And so it's really strange to me that they're not not only no longer central, but almost not uh, taught in mainstream psychotherapy training. And so a lot of people go through all of their psychotherapy training without any idea how to work with dreams unless they seek it out uh, specifically. And for someone like me who uh, I took my training at Pacifica Graduate Institute, my master's level training. And so I learned about dreams as part of my initial uh, training as a therapist. And I could not imagine doing this work without the help of dreams. And so uh, I think, why has it been marginalized? I think it's mostly the, the sort of trend toward evidence-based approaches and uh, times, you know, time-limited uh, psychotherapeutic sessions and time-limited in terms of scope and length. And, and so, Dream work is it's seen, I think, by a lot of people as esoteric and um, on the fringe and takes too long, is too complicated, all of those reasons. And why, why should we work with dreams? I have so, so much I could say about that. But what I will say, just to kind of cut to the chase, is that dreams, they, they give a picture of what's going on at a deeper level what's happening under the surface, uh, very often pick up on our most 
uh, salient kind of questions or the things we're struggling with, even if we're not aware that we're struggling with them. So they, they cut to the chase. They bring um, the, the topic of conversation right to the heart of the matter. And uh, if you're in, uh, if you're coming to um, someone for psychotherapy, it seems to me, well, being a therapist for 25 years, I can say people don't always get to the heart of the matter. There's a, um, there's a lot of um, a, a problem focus and a lot of repetition. And I think dreams make the, make, um, the process very efficient. And they, the dialogue is very, it, it deepens immediately. There's an instant um, connection to at the, at the soul level, if you want. I, I mean, that's a loaded word, but uh, it just, it drops it, it for, for me, when I was sit with someone in their dream, it drops us into a level of dialogue that's instantly so much deeper than what would happen otherwise. So that's a start. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because it brings up some deep uh, questions about how we know ourselves. You know, philosophers have long been interested in the question of how do we know the world and how do we know ourselves? And it's then almost ironic to speak about evidence-based uh, um, paradigms getting in the way and, and in some way maybe blocking off what has long been considered a, a, a huge realm of, of, uh, of access and, and a huge realm of resource uh, for knowing ourselves in the world. And isn't that such a, a strange thing that we the paradigm seems to be so strained that it it, it doesn't knowledge has become there a, a, an an darkenment, not an enlightenment. Well, this is what we know. It's evidence based, and you're saying, well, that's funny because it turns out I think a lot of the evidence based things don't always get to the core issue. That if we just and there I hear Socrates once again. Socrates always remind us that Sophia wisdom that she does not like clocks. And she's not interested of, uh, in our schedules and our agendas. And she said, look, if you want to know yourself and you want to know me and the world, you're going to have to throw out the clock. But then there too, it's so interesting. You're saying, well, but if you just did take that time, well, you'd save yourself a lot of wheel spinning, you know? <laughs> yes. yes, it is ironic. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I have a maybe um, just a, a problem with the nature of the evidence that is used to show that psychotherapy is successful because mm -hmm. it's trying to um, boil it down to something that's repeatable and it's never repeatable. There are two different people in the room every time in a different situation and, and so much life experience that, that, and the, and then the combination of, of the therapist and the ther and the, and the analyst and, or the client um, that you can't possibly repeat it. And so, I mean, and, then the, the way to, you know, do experiments is to have the, um, the enterprise boil down to even more basic steps. So it's a very watered down version that you're testing against, sometimes against just no treatment at all, your wait list. And so how is that, how is that evidence that it's, it, that it's, it's really helpful? I'm, I'm definitely showing my bias here, but um, I think well, it's really, okay. <laughs> really. I'm the same way. I, somet I sometimes put that this way. If you want, how do you produce make mindfulness? Well, you ask scientists to give you an evidence-based version of mindfulness, extract from the tradition, ignore 90% of what it says. Give me something that's, you know, a little bit fragmented and that's how you get make mindfulness. And so we're going to have make dream work if we allow this, this current paradigm to do it. But if we were to expand the paradigm or, or recognize that the paradigm needs to shift, then yeah, sure, you could have science that would uh, integrate variables rather than isolating them. That could be an important thing to do. It's so funny how I, what came to mind as you were talking about that is how Jung talked about synchronicity. It's almost mm -hmm. as if you could say, well, the therapeutic process just is a process of allowing synchronicity to happen, but we sometimes call it insight. And but we, you know, it, it's that you know, you're playing at that deep level because he was saying that's the issue. It's not repeatable. 
it's it's a unique thing that happens and so you can't put a formula on it and and it's it also then relates to what Pauli thought that that as you deepen your your uh, uh, practice as your consciousness begins to you could say expand if that's how you want to put it that the synchronicities increase and maybe the dreams too as a way to tell you yes you're it's happening and so there is this kind of uh you're in the material world with a therapist and then you go into the dream world and they're they're more permeable than we realize and Definitely. important to take care of them both as interrelated as deeply profoundly related and yeah, that's really really great yeah i think the dreams uh actually respond to that kind of attention and so when you slow down and really give them attention, they they'll that you know the dream maker, whatever where your dreams come from, they'll come with more, and there'll be an answer to what's transpired. They may comment on the therapy situation itself, but they're not always uh, purely personal either. I really like the transpersonal nature nature of dreaming. It it gets um, people to think beyond their own self and in how they relate to the wider, uh, wider mystery. And there's, you know, I think there's such value in that to relativizing the ego and, and, you know, really just connecting people to what's, what's larger than themselves and outside of themselves. Mm. It's one of the best vehicles I know for that. Yeah. I, I, I like what you, you, there was a link there between uh, the slowing down and the dream it's as if the dreams are are always asking us to slow down and the, it, it ha they have to get louder if we don't or if the matter is urgent you know you're going to keep having this nightmare until you really stop and find someone who can help you and in this context that could be very hard to find somebody but you have you can't <laughs> we need you to do this to go on says the soul and uh there's that too is part of the philosophical way of life is that we allow life to stop us to slow us down and we realize that the medicine of awareness that you can't have the change without bringing that awareness and for us it means we have to slow down and really let the awareness open because it's so funny that the mind we're using day to day is considered not to be a very good mind from the standpoint of the wisdom tradition they say yeah you're using this mind all the time but you have no idea you're it's very limited thing that you're doing and if you could deepen it and that requires the awareness and then the dream sometimes that's what it does it holds us holds our attention maybe that's part of why the therapy session shifts right because you have something that's just interesting and you sense that it's come from a larger ecology of mind that is mysterious in a certain way and then you have to slow down mm -hmm. you almost have to turn your mind off honestly i i think uh that a lot of people were greeted with this mysterious dream and they're always so um well, not always, but most often very bizarre, or curious, or there's something about them, especially our own dreams, that's very captivating. And yet people cannot tell you what they mean, especially our own dreams. We're quite obtuse about our own dreams. And their initial take um, is often to decipher them and figure, okay, what does this mean? If I People always ask me because they know I, I like talking about dreams and thinking about dreams. I had this dream and I want they want me to immediately give them an answer to their dream. Right, right. And I think, well, <laughs> I can't really do that. Uh, it would take me at least an hour to uh, ask you um, to feel into your dream. And then I'm not the one that's going to come up with the answer. You are. Yeah. And it's not even really an answer. It's more of an experience. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 well, I, I talk about this in my book and, and it's one of the things I really like to talk about um, with people who are wanting to work with dreams is that there's, there's like this, what I call the dream divide, where there's the the, the person-centered approach to dreams, where we look at the dream and go, what does it say about me? What does it tell me I'm supposed to do with my love life or my you know work life? And is it going to give me some kind of direction and magical solution to uh, whatever I'm you know up against at the moment? Or there's the dream-centric version, where really we're immersed in a dream and the dream is bigger than us. And our job is more about finding out how to be in service to the dream and to relativize our role in it, to, to, you know, have our ego kind of step aside and 
I talk about the dream ego a lot and the dream ego is our avatar in the dream that usually gets center stage or gets a lot of attention from the dreamer. And I try to just um, let that part of the dream be just a, another character in the dream. And mm -hmm. it's usually a, a character that's, that's fumbling and in trouble and can't figure out their way home or to the airport or lost their keys or they're usually, it's usually not a, um, a, a character in the dream that's in command or in, you know, in feeling very confident. And so I invite people to experience all the other ways that the dream is showing up and then just it, holding that in their body, not really thinking about it, just experiencing it. And then I think that's where you get a sense of what the dream is bringing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. A very Socratic approach because Socrates thought, it, it seems to me that uh, it, it's hard to tell because the dialogues are mysterious in a way. Plato says that he didn't put the philosophy really in the dialogues, not in the, not in the overt way, that you had to come to him for the teachings. But you, I think you can sense a whole lot and you can get a certain feel for things that maybe he didn't agree with and things that he did. But therapeia is, uh, that's the old way of seeing philosophy as therapeia. And that is very Socratic in that it, it indicates to attend, an attendant. And Socrates seems to see us as an attendant of the sacred here. Our job is to attend to the, you, you, you could say divine, because for him he was kind of a religious guy. So we're here to attend to the divine or attend to the sacred. And when the sacred appears in a dream, it, you attend to it. It might come as a voice. For Socrates it did, a voice that never let him do the wrong thing. If he was about to do something that, that was not good, the voice would say, Socrates, don't do that, and he would hear it. And he uh, talks about his dreams even. I always love that he, you know, at the, he's in the prison cell at the end of his life, and and it's his last day, and uh, he knows he's going to drink the hemlock, and the students come in and they see him writing. I says, "What are you doing? I'm writing poetry. Why are you doing that? Well, I had that dream again. You know the dream I've told you about, where the divine says to me, Socrates, cultivate the arts, and I always thought she was encouraging me, saying." cultivate the art of life, be a philosopher, do what you're doing. And then I thought, well, what if she really meant art, art? <laughs> what if it was <laughs> more narrow? And I thought I should try to write some poems. So, but he, he, the point was he wanted to respond. He wanted to receive that call and to attend. And there too, it requires that. He, he teaches that it requires a certain kind of presence, not just, oh, uh, what's my dream, but really to change the way we're operating. The way you put it, we, he, I think they might say, let go of your habitual mind, not let go of the mind, but touch the deeper or fuller. And I, I'm sure you have that sense too. If the soul refers to the holistic mind, not the little thing we run around with and say, this is me. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Or um, I, you know, also a student of Robert Bosnick who, who calls it habitual consciousness and he um, has a similar practice, a little more intense, because he has people embody various aspects of the dream all at the same time, right. kind of put them in a pressure cooker. Um, yeah. But to, to really enter into the um, progressively more difficult or foreign elements in the dream, so you get further and further away from what feels familiar yes. and out of your habitual consciousness and into something much larger and and that 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 in itself is the point of it not anything more not not some grand conclusion or oh now i know what i need to do it's not like that you just become mm. a larger person a yeah. larger vessel for uh, various ways of being and i mean we are that we just don't necessarily operate with the whole spectrum yes. and i think dreams help us they show us <laughs> where we're maybe not um, not attending or, or not living um, uh, you know fully or not fully conscious of all of the ways that we could be in the world. Right, right, yes. Yes, because the little ego can't. I mean, that's part of the this ecology of mind. A, a part can't know the whole. The whole know, can know the whole. <laughs> and uh, that's a different kind of knowing. There's, there's not a, an ordinary knower in that case. There's an ecology. It's interesting. I, 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 it occurred to me as you were describing, because I, of course, read your description of your work with uh, Bosnak, and 
I suddenly thought, wait, is he asking people, would Jung say you're asking them to hold a complex? You're actually asking them to touch what would ordinarily be unconscious, and that's why it's unfamiliar, you're, because you're, it's something that the ego doesn't see. It can only see parts of it. It can't perceive the complex. The therapist might see it, or our friends might see it, but, but the ego can only hold pieces of it and can't put it together. But if you then assemble and then are, you're holding each piece one by one and then you're holding them all, you're really holding that complex and it, then too, you've, you've attended to it. And that allows for the therapeus some evolution to happen. Yeah, I think it could be more than, even more than the complex, you know, that there's that, mm -hmm. that personal element and then there's yeah. also in some of the dream images the um, the elements that are really beyond our personal experience oh, yeah. as well, and mm -hmm. um, you know I never thought about it specifically like that. I know that I've witnessed a lot of um, transformation in the way that that um, Robert works, uh, but. I don't personally do it that way because it it puts intense pressure on on a person and. Yeah. It's a little bit hmm, aggressive, I guess, is how I experience it. Uh, yeah. And I'm not that way. I, I, I feel like the um, um, the better way is for, for, for my, um, I guess, focusing oriented approach is to allow it to um, kind of be a, a, an interaction, uh, um, hmm. something that happens a little bit more fluidly or like silk or like it it isn't forced and it's still it's still it's still challenging but um i i i just ease a person into their dream world i enter it with them as well i think over time i've gotten to be more adept at this where i have an image of their dream as they're describing it i don't know if it's accurate but i feel like i'm walking in it with them and so they have company and then we pick up any people or things in the dream that are also company. And then with that, that extra kind of support, then the other pieces of the dream start to look different. They just do the, the, the scary elements or the foreign elements, they really do shift in, in real time if you do that. And mm. then, and then what happens after that is really totally unpredictable. Mm. And I never have a, a preconception about anything in a dream, whether it's good or bad, or, you know, I don't use those value judgments at all. And I really don't think dreams have, they're not the same world. They don't, you know, a, a big scary monster isn't necessarily a bad thing. And a, a beautiful flower isn't necessarily a good thing. It's, it's really about meeting it as a complete unknown. Yeah, that's really uh, so interesting because the, that's the idea is that the ego is is the known and there's this other, I mean, even if we were to put it in, in sort of um, contemporary language, which maybe we can touch on that because I, I, I do think it's so funny, the, these discussions of memory consolidation, <laughs> uh, that's one of the theories for what, why we're dreaming. And what I think is funny about that is it it subtly in a habitual way whatever people might say or proclaim it imagines that there is a faculty of memory whereas mind is not broken into pieces you can't if you had zero memory you don't have a functioning mind and so it's not it seems to me that's a miss the reason why it's important too is that you're telling people well you're consolidating memory rather than no this the soul is making itself forward and you, the, you, then you have to be so careful then, well, what do you want to make of yourself? What will you make tonight? What will you have paid attention to during the day that then you made salient or you enjoyed or savored the emotion or metabolized the emotion or didn't? And all of that is about you making yourself and the world onward, that we're making the world onward. And the, the memory consolidation thing just seems so uh, typical of our you know, very linear approach, and your 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 mind is trapped inside of a skull, as opposed to it might be bigger, and that's what you were gesturing to too. That the elements in the dream that seem to be transpersonal—that means they're not, but maybe mind itself, what we consider personal. Well, I I can't locate it inside a bag of skin or in a skull. You know, I can't find it in there. But it's uh, it's an interesting 
I don't know. It's, I think it's a weird. It shows where we're still anemic in our theorizing, I think. Yeah, it gets a bit swimmy to talk about. Um, I do think there is a way that the dreaming is implicated in what we what we pick up from our recent experience and what we carry forward. Not that we choose it. We actually aren't choosing it in the dreaming. It's happening while we're actually not. We don't have much volition at all. But when we have a dream, we can, we can point our attention or attend to, to what, what came. And that then becomes a, where we co-create this process or we participate in the process because our attention then, I guess it would consolidate it to some degree. It would become mm. much more uh, apparent. It would become much more easy to recall. And so if you believe that what's happening uh, when we're sleeping and when um, other forces are, are at work, we're just much more fluid. If you believe that that's really valuable, then paying attention to your dreams will bring that. It, it just brings it more to life and it creates a whole relationship with this other world, which I find, uh, um, I don't have great words for it. it it's enlarging, it's deepening, it, it's, it, it mm. makes, it makes life richer and um, slower at the same time. Yeah. And it depends really so much on who's dreaming and what their, what their mission is, I suppose. I don't mm -hmm. presume to have, you know, like some people simply w want to sort out their, their, their personal life or they want um, to just have their nightmares stop. And yeah. So it's not always this esoteric, it's sometimes very practical and dreams can operate at that level too. They can give um, pretty clear pictures of what is. They don't mm. necessarily tell you what to do about it, but I've found if you sit with a dream that, that really feels related to a current life issue, it's a very honest portrayal. It's a very much sort of a, yep, go yep, that's actually exactly how it is and that's helpful mm. it's helpful to really get an honest picture sometimes yeah and isn't that uh, an interesting aspect of it to be able to to be willing to see ourselves and that might be why we're we don't have as much dream work is that there's a way for therapy to get co-opted into the pattern of insanity. The therapy is, is, you could say that the, it doesn't matter what the therapist intends, the larger ecology, because you were talking about volition, it's such an interesting question philosophically. Uh, it, maybe we'll come back to that a little bit, but the, but my I may claim the intention that I genuinely want to help you, but the larger pattern in the culture might say, yeah, you can help them, but not in a way where it's gonna stop them from doing what we want them to do. We can't right, have that. and, you know, yes. Right. And so, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, even I'm thinking, too, of of that famous moment where Jung meets the person who's supposedly a shaman, right, in, in Africa. And he's asking the fellow about dreams. And he says, oh, I know what you mean. My father used to have those. <laughs> you don't dream. No. And he, he was crying. And, and uh, he said, Why, what, what do we need to dream for? The district commissioner tells us wh what the weather will do, where to move, what to, when we're going to fight. And, and so there it might be something in the larger culture repressing too much from the dream, too much commentary about, well, your life, that job is meaningless. You should quit it. Your capitalism is ridiculous. You should find a way to stop it. We can't have that. So then therapists are all running secretly hiding from the truth <laughs> yeah i hadn't thought about that but it's it is true that dreams are uh, a little bit outside of time and uh -huh. not so concerned with um the sort of day-to-day -day concerns of life or or fitting in or um you know yeah. the the they're they yeah they can be kind of subversive and the other thing is that it's not just in the therapy where uh, there, the, it's that enterprise is kind of turned away from dreams is that people also turn away from their dreams and probably for similar reasons. Yes. There's a, there's, a, I think a recognition, but not a conscious recognition that this is asking something of us 
that is a little bit different or maybe a lot different from what we're already doing or is just a really honest picture of what might be right and what might be wrong with it and it's very easy to then just dismiss them because they do come in a bizarre form and you can just say well that made me uncomfortable that's it's just nonsense or I already know what it means is usually the easiest way to dismiss it right. to say yeah I, I already know about this dream I know what it's all about that not willing unwillingness to um be with the the not knowing yeah, that's it. Yeah, I definitely meant to implicate that as well. So thank you for elaborating it. Absolutely, that's the the sort of. I mean, sometimes even I'll tell people if you if if you are ready, you then say before say to your soul before you go to sleep, I really am ready to see some truth tonight, and I really ask you to reveal it to me. And I I know I'm going to be okay. I know it's just going to be a dream. I just really want to know some truth. And I promise to try to remember it tomorrow and to to live it in some way. You have to be ready for that. And I don't encourage some novice person that you have to have some practice to know that you can turn toward the difficult thing. That's part of what the wisdom traditions would say about dreaming is that you know when you look in the Tibetan tradition or or if you consider a figure like Socrates or how the ancient Greeks behaved with relationship to these uh, these entrances to the vast ecology of mind that is the soul uh, you don't do it you don't practice dream yoga without preliminaries and th there might be a lot of training to really know that you have the compassion to turn toward something that might at first be scary to the ego and that you have verified your trust in yourself to work with that because otherwise it can be scary and it could even be traumatizing potentially so we can handle these things too lightly. And maybe that's part of the same thing is there's a self-defense mechanism of the system and a self-defense mechanism of our ego saying, well, well, we haven't been in this culture given the training to know that we could look at the, what the soul might really ask that would be so scary. And uh, if we, that's why I'm always encouraging the uh, more, you know, the, I see psychology as s such a sister to philosophy as, as having really grown from it as, as Jung kind of recognized himself as a philosopher. And that's why I think it's more dialogue between psychologists and philosophers is so important because we could then help to, the wisdom traditions have these things to help strengthen us. So that if you know you can receive it, then you can receive the more difficult thing. <laughs> and um, I think also it's interesting because you're talking about this, how unknown it is. And, you know, Jung's got a couple of these places where he talks about, you know, he says, we, we sometimes act like uh, the consciousness is this big thing. And then the dream is like a little bag that fragments from the day fall into. And he said, that's backwards. <laughs> You know, the vast thing is the psyche and little fragments. And that's exactly the way Gregory Bateson or or a contemporary cognitive scientist might put it, that it's a matter of bandwidth, people. You, what you are identifying as I is so tiny. And there's this vast thing that also doesn't operate always in a strictly linear sequence. It's it, it, it's so when you're in it, of course it has to be different because it's it's parallel, non-linear, not concerned about time in a strict way. Maybe is in touch with other times and other places, which freaks us out. We don't want to hear. It. So it's really nice that you're saying, okay, the not knowing is important because all this knowledge we have is that in darkenment. It, it's like it's one of the defense mechanisms. I know this thing, and so therefore I keep it at a distance. Mm -hmm. Forgetting is also another way. I don't think we um, hold on to the dreams that are too much for us. Honestly, I think the dreams themselves are edited. Not not that they, not that they edit themselves, but that we yeah. edit them without really even realizing we're doing it. We'll have a big dream. Sometimes you know you have that sense of waking up and oh my gosh, I I went so far. I went I had all the answers I ever wanted to hear and this dream and, and it was, it, you know, went on and on. And I, all I remember is the sense of having dreamt yeah. it. I don't know anything else about it right. or the dreams will be snippets or they'll be uh, tolerable. You know, they're often, unless someone's got um, trauma breaking through like those kind of trauma nightmares that are uh, really just um, another animal. I think the dreams themselves typically, um, 
the the dreams that people do remember or are willing to work with or bring they it's kind of a self editing process i've i i, I rarely see people drop a, a great big dream into a session without any kind of preparedness for it or ca capability of being with it and i've i've had people come to me and say well i've been carrying this dream around for you know, 15 or 20 years and now i think i'm i'm ready to to work with this dream so they know when they have it that this is a really big dream and that they're not they weren't ready until they were ready so mm -hmm. i do think that it's okay even without training and i i you know i i like that idea however i also think you could you could wait forever if you wanted to be ready and yeah. so at some point i feel like you need to jump in and the dreams themselves will help you they yes. don't necessarily put you in over your head, although they can. I'm not saying that they can't, but yeah. a lot of times they seem to be um, either self-selecting or our memory will self-select or we will just not choose or see a dream as important until we're actually ready to be with whatever it is that they're they're bringing yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that that we're 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 saying something resonant there in the sense that what I I certainly wouldn't um, want to suggest that people can't work with their dreams uh, at all. Um, but the idea, it, the most important element of what I was suggesting there is that as we verify our capacity to turn toward difficult things, then the difficult things can come, and as we deepen an actual wisdom in life, then we have the we really have a knowing of those things in a different way so that they don't seem like what they would have seemed to the other me that was you know undeveloped so the idea is again bringing them together that if the culture could give us more training if we could draw from the wisdom traditions then more and more people would have the strength to receive more and more from their dreams and they, they go together yeah you start with the fragments and then you know you can elaborate over time that's really that's wonderful. And it's such a Freudian thing to suggest when people are being so dismissive about, of course, the idea that the whole thing is just um, uh, this this tension between manifest and latent content and you know the id and um, but you're suggesting now, but still there is there is a mechanism of repression that we verified scientifically. In fact, that's one of the things I think is so wonderful that people were even skeptical of that. And there was that famous, very famous exchange between the philosopher of science and the, I don't know if you remember the the articles or they went back and forth where the the the, the psychologist was trying to um, provide verification that the philosopher of science would agree to. And then finally, the philosopher wrote him a single line email saying, I am satisfied you have verified that repression exists. <laughs> So that's really great, and but it is so such. It's humbling then too to think that our ego is doing this, and it's such a reminder. I'm always trying to to remind people that there is a part of us that is scared of reality, and that if we won't admit that, then we won't be able to overcome that that mechanism that might be filtering. That we really have to be able to say, well, okay, something in me is scared to see the fuller truth. If I don't take care of that part and don't strengthen my myself overall, then I might not be able to receive what I really need in this life. Yeah, I think some people go through their lives without doing that. Yeah. And or their dreams stop. Lots of people will tell me, you know, when I talk about dreams, it seems to come up around me a lot because of my interest in them. Yeah. That uh they don't dream or they don't remember their dreams. Yes. And they're uh, like, you know, maybe wishing that they could remember their dreams. And, yes. but I, I feel like, uh, there's a reason and, and it is that turning away from anything dreamlike or not paying attention, not being willing to catch them or turn to, to them or pay attention to what little pieces you have or, um, dismissing them in the various ways that, that we, we can, that after a while, it's like the dreams give up, or they just yeah, uh, yeah. there's a um, a way that I mean I feel like we're dreaming all the time, and they're just under the level of 
of our habitual consciousness and they're always yeah. available. Like someone's analogy, uh, as Ruben Nyman, his, his analogy was that they're like the stars. They're always there. You just can't yes. see them until it's dark. And so right. I feel like it's a, it's a, a river that's running underneath us all the time. And we can always dip into that, um, yeah. the dreaming. And, it, but mm. it's a particular way of being that isn't really, it's not encouraged. It's a it's a it's a willingness to be uh, in the not knowing and a willingness to be in the experiencing of the moment yeah. and with ourselves. All those and all those, if you yeah. and if you if you, I guess I'm getting I'm getting to understand what you mean by training because you you can't just do that all unless you've practiced it. That's and right. Maybe one piece at a time and then putting them together. Yes, because you're making, that's where in part it relates a little bit to the thought that was, there's so much, there's so much richness as, as the mandala of our dialogue opens up. But I was uh, uh, thinking in part about a, a past episode about the idea of night vision. And uh, that well, that's why one of Sophia's spirit animals is the owl, because the owl can see in, in the places that the daytime uh, mind can't. But um this is partly how there is the, the volition in the sense. So for, let's say from a Buddhist psychological standpoint, what is this mind? This mind is the mind that grew out of the mind before. You, you, you didn't choose this mind. Spontaneous. But it did depend on the mind you had before. So when you are looking at your experience, you are looking at your practice of life. What you've practiced. If you keep practicing anger, then it's going to be unsurprising for us to find you angry. But if you kept practicing compassion, it would be unsurprising for us to find you compassionate. I mean, we would be surprised that maybe Donald Trump was having compassion, but you know, not so much the Dalai Lama. And so the idea is that, yes, this mind spontaneously appears, but dependent on what you did before. And so, therefore, I can have a, the will to receive a more a challenging dream or a bigger vision because I have practiced in such a way that the mind could spontaneously produce that. And then there's that related idea that the the dreamer, like the artist, visits, they dip into that river, they visit the place that the mystic is supposed to be living. And that's why Socrates was you know, saying, yes, this when we live like this, it gives us the best things we have. We don't have control over the best things we have. Um, but they come as if from as if from the mystery, the divine, and and the, the the dream realm feels like that. I think that's why people feel that reverence in part, isn't it? And it's not just oh, it's me, but we feel like something special. Wow, something came, and I know it was maybe partly my life, but it still feels like a sacred thing happened here a little bit, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, it's true. It's like being visited by a wild animal. I think of it very similarly. That yeah. there's a uh, uh, an awe from that, and it's 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 just so um, uh, precious that they would come to you, and there it feels important. And I know when people do start to warm up to talking about their dreams, they're engaged in a way that is much different—a different quality from how they would be engaged with their story of their work or their relationship. Or mm. it has it does have a sacred quality or a mysterious quality that everybody I think ultimately um, starts to pick up on. I, I do find when people warm to the topic that dreams are incredibly um, fascinating, magnetic uh, to, to, to all of us. Mm. I, mean, I mean, other than the people who have really terrifying dreams and, and just want them to stop. But yes, yes. there's a, yeah, I, I think you're right. There's a, there's a sense in all of us. It touches on this, um, larger self and 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 much more than I could really articulate. I, I I think the more I study dreams and sit with dreams, the less I feel like I understand them or know something. But I think that's yeah. appropriate. Yes. Can I ask you what you would say? I and I know because I read your book some of the things you say, but but to talk for people listening or watching, what are things that we could do? And what kind of track record have you seen for someone who says, look, I, I, I'm, I can't remember anything, or I, even to the point where they say, I don't even know if I dream, uh, or maybe it's only fragments. How much confidence can you give them that it could change and what could they do to change it? Yeah, so the first thing is intention, you know, just having the intention to remember your dreams and 
get a dream journal or a recorder or some way of capturing them. So you've, you've basically got the, um, the, you know, the intention and it's concrete. And then when you, uh, when you wake up, it's really important because our REM sleep is concentrated toward the morning. The last couple hours of sleep are the longest REM periods. And so the richest dream time. And so in that, um, when you first start to wake up, there, it, there will be dreaming. There will be dreaming. Even if you say you don't dream, everybody dreams like a, a, a couple hours a night. So we all do. And it's really important to our, to our, um, our psyche, to our, our health. It's, it's, it's got a lot of critical benefits. So we all dream and you know that you're dreaming right in the morning. That's just a, a given. And so how you wake up, I think is really important. If you wake up and immediately are fully awake, you're not going to catch the dreams because when we're dreaming, our brain is in a state of, unless we're lucid in our dreams, our brain is in a state where we're experiencing completely, but we're not remembering anything. Our, our tape recorder isn't running. So it, it's in the crossover between dreaming and waking that will catch we'll catch some of that we'll be able to remember it because we're partially in dream and we're partially in waking uh, awareness and so it's important to sort of make that extend that time this liminal in between state where you try to lie really still and try to stay with where you were ask yourself where was i just now what was i what was i um seeing trying to just um, catch just a little fragment, even a fragment will bring uh, sometimes the whole pull the thread and the whole thing will come. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, you know, even if you feel like, okay, I've got this and it's, it's really clear and it's amazing and I'll never forget it. You, you, you very likely will, unless, you know, I always um, rehearse it in my mind a few times before I start to, shift my mind to other things. And then I write it down. I'd say, write it down right away, as much of it as you can remember. And then you'll have it. And then more can come. I know I, I ask people to do this when I work with their dreams. And when I get them, I get them to re-enter that dreaming state. There, there's a whole world there that they don't always um, remember everything. It's, it's, it's really telling that they've re-entered it when things come back to them that they hadn't remembered in the morning but it's it's really just kind of slowing down the waking up not having a, an alarm clock or um having something you immediately got to do if your mind um mind is <laughs> if you're you know thinking about what i've got to do next and you're 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 on to your day and that track your dreams are going to get lost and they mm. will unless they're very striking i think that's why nightmares are so striking is that Sometimes our dream world really wants our attention. And so they'll, it'll send us a dream that's unforgettable and we have to respond to it. But mm. otherwise you kind of have to catch them. Yeah. And napping is also a good way to catch dreams or daydreaming, you know, a kind of a reverie, letting yourself drift into a, a kind of a dreamy state while awake. Cause I don't think it's that different and yeah. it, you know, it'll feel like you're making it up, but yeah, you, you could be, but, but from all the things that you could million things you could be thinking about, this is what you're, um, this is what's coming and it's, it's letting your mind drift, not, not directing it and seeing what comes. So all of those things can be treated like dreams. So the, 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 the dreams that you remember upon waking or the dreams you have when you're kind of in a state of reverie or, or just drifting in and out of sleep having a, like an afternoon nap is also a good, a good time to catch dreams because especially if you're sleep deprived, you'll slip into REM right away yeah. and there'll be dreams. So those are all uh, ways to catch dreams. And when you catch them, treat them very, like they're very precious and then more will come. Mm, yeah. Well, uh, there too, you can see yourself as an attendant and the intention uh, from the wisdom tradition standpoint wouldn't just be I intend to dream and remember the dream, but I'm intending the dream as as part of liberation, as a practice of uh, understanding myself and the world and living a good life. And then it, it becomes integrated. It's not that I dream, but uh, I'm actually on a path of life and I really want everything to be in there. 
and then I move forward that way. It's interesting too that maybe you saw the the uh, it was in January. Science Magazine released that study where they d duplicated what Dali used to do. He used to um, Salvador Dali. He would uh, uh, n nap holding a maybe a paintbrush, and uh, w when the paintbrush hit the floor, it would wake him up, and then he would work with what he had just seen. And they did this uh, and showed that you, it actually does produce scientific insights. You know, so okay. a scientist is working on; they can do the same thing. And if you if you rouse someone, so there are all these kind of interesting ways to look at it. And both, what's interesting too in the some of the wisdom traditions is you find part of the practice seeing the dreamlike quality of this a supposedly awakened moment. And to begin to recognize that the same processes ultimately are at work in both cases. And this is part of the journey to lucidity. And so I find too that um, if you have the opportunity to practice a lot of mind, if you can find a way to, to practice a lot of mindfulness, if you, for instance, go for a really mindful walk in the forest and you treat it like it's a dream. And you're looking with the same, as if you were lucid saying, I made this tree. Because when you have a lucid dream, and for me, I always, I'm always so impressed. <laughs> I think we're all geniuses. This dirt really feels like dirt. This tree really feels like a tree and it looks so good. But if you just take a mindful walk and you look at that tree branch and you kind of say, wow, that I'm seeing my own mind, because of course, you're not seeing a tree outside of yourself in some way, but it's experience. You're producing this experience and you don't know how you're doing it. It's spontaneous. You can't will the tree gone. So you, in a sense, don't have volition, but you're just looking. And then that can really um, amplify your capacity to attend and receive to a dream, a dream sometimes. The other thing that you didn't happen to mention, but uh, I, I notice sometimes if you if you wake up and you can't remember much or you're trying to remember back, if you sometimes if you go do something, but don't let it be anything too big, you know, like go to the bathroom and then you just go back and just lay down awake again, just for and just see what comes to your mind. The first thing that pops into your mind might be an image from a dream. So even if you couldn't wake up early, you might say, okay, I'll, I'll get the coffee started or I'll do something. And then I'll just like lay down for 30 seconds and see if more comes. And it's surprising how sometimes it will do that. Mm. Yeah. If you don't fully wake up and you stay in that um, more daydreamy state. Yeah. Or, you know, and sometimes dreams will just, they'll flash um, spontaneously during the day. You'll have yes. some yeah. association right. that suddenly oh your dream comes back to you in its yeah. entirety and it's very interesting that it's not always a direct link from what you're doing to your dream but they can return yeah and in treating life as a waking dream i think does help it's a certain uh attitude uh toward um i think it's a very non-directed attitude very much in a, a receptive attitude to everything yeah. and then uh, there isn't so much of a distinction between yeah. how you are when you're dreaming and how you are when you're awake. Right. And it's, it's giving yourself, and it doesn't mean that you don't like, sometimes you do need to have, have focused attention, but I think I've just been writing about this, how little time we give to that sort of unfocused, um, mm -hmm. allowing our mind to wander and just be wild and, and do what it will and so uh, we lose that, um, maybe lose that capacity or uh, it, it feels like a waste of time or boring. Mm -hmm. and, and I know a lot of, like, I love this. I, you know, I go for long walks in the woods. I, I hunt for mushrooms when the mushrooms are up and I, I spend a lot of time out there. And I, and I never, um, almost never have my phone except to take pictures. And I don't listen to um, even your podcast. I don't, I just, I just let, that my mind wander and i think a lot of that space is being eaten up these days with with um just read this book called stolen focus and it was all about this idea that we're not letting our minds have their their free reign and so we're not uh, letting ourselves daydream or 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 we'll let our mind kind of do what it will and in that time there's a lot of really important things that happen that uh, that just don't get a chance to. We don't have enough time when we sleep. 
our sleep's being eroded. It, it's kind of a, you talk about the ecology of our, of our, of our mind and our consciousness. And I think it's being eroded in these ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We both read uh, Nyman's article about the uh, kind of uh, REM deficit that yes, we are experiencing yes. so that uh, that might be something for people to be aware of. It's not just that you, again, I, I think that cultural level is important. It's, it's to say that your dreams are threatening to the culture. And so it's draining them away from you. There is a, a there is a reduction in REM sleep. So we're having like a, uh, not only a sleep crisis, but a REM crisis. We're not getting enough rest and we're not dreaming enough. And then we're not given the tools to know what it would mean to, to let the dreams inform our life. In a very, uh, it's very participatory, I would say. You were saying very receptive and I understand what you mean by that. You're not being, you're not being, you're letting go of the doer, but it's like a uh, participatory and responsive at the same time, you know, like really letting there be a dance and that you know that you really feel engaged, but you're not controlling it. Uh, so somehow there's a place there and you're right, we're not allowed to have this um, non-directive time, unstructured time. David Strayer's work also comes to mind here too, right? Because of the, uh, he found out that, and this well, this is something that the spiritual traditions have, have known. If you ask a spiritual teacher who's run retreats, they'll say, you know, even, even if a person's got a daily practice of like an hour or two hours a day, they meditate every day, it's still going to take them two or three days to to produce what I would consider a workable mind. They don't, you don't realize that this mind you're operating out of is just, it's not very conducive to insight into reality and that participatory thing where you can receive and be engaged at the same time. And uh, Strayer found that with, um, because his, he's a, a, a researcher and he would, he'd like to do these, uh, you know, backcountry hiking things. And he, he realized that all his best ideas, he felt like they weren't coming while he was in the lab in the ecology of science, you know, they were coming when he was out in the wilderness, but only after about three, four days. So he's asking people and they say, oh yeah, man, it takes you a while to decompress from all that. And so he ran a study and he, two groups, one went and just relaxed. <laughs> they were, you know, um, but they were still around, they were in a built environment and, and so on. The other group went into wilderness, no tech, no nothing. And both groups, given uh, creativity and cognitive measures, the wilderness group got 50% higher scores. So 50% increase in creativity and cognitive capacity by letting your mind get out of the thing that we're trapped in and that is also making it hard for us to dream. And of course, the corporations, don't they don't like us to sleep. They want us to binge watch and buy things. So it's yeah. all, all feeding into True. making sure we don't dream. <laughs> Dreamed. We don't dream and we don't daydream and we don't let our minds wander. Yeah, the book I was referring to is by Johan Hari, Stolen Focus. Okay. And um, if you haven't read it, it's it's really, um, it's quite alarming actually how, yeah. um, how much of uh, our attention is being, uh, he says quite deliberately um, oh, co-opted yes. oh, no and, and how, how, how devastating that is yeah. to us and the world. It's really, it's quite a um, profound <laughs> book, very, very frightening. And um, I, I think he, to, to, to research the book, he actually gave up all his tech and uh, he's an information junkie and said this, this particular phenomenon has been happening since before the internet and before cell phones. It's just because we've got, we're not designed to take this barrage of, of information and stimulation coming at us. We just get overwhelmed and then can't really function the way we're, we're maybe made to. So the wilderness is about the right amount of input. It seems like it's, it's quieter and more still. And I know I crave time out in the wilderness. I, I spend a lot of time out there. Yeah, but it's engaged, right? Because you can't be mindless no. in, the, in the wild, right? So your mind is really there and it's meaningful. So much of what we're um, are surrounded with is ultimately kind of empty. You know, there's it's very hard to find media that seems profound. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It does. There are really nice examples of things that are exceptional works of art or, or have a real philosophical significance, um, including there is this animated series, in fact, that uh, Amazon had. Um, I think it's called Undone. And it is about the kind of play between reality and dream. And it's, it's done in animation, but in a kind of realistic 
um, style and animation. It's it's well done, okay, but that's still not the same as you know studying Plato or Buddha or something and going out into the woods. And Buddha himself said that too. That you when you go into the wilderness, he said um, any fool can go into the wilderness. What mind will you take? Then that's going to de- that's going to determine what the wilderness will say to you and what you can receive there. What kinds of insights? It's all the practice of life you have that you take into. It. But it's also interesting how it's almost like the system learned to mine attention. I always think of it as some sci-fi horror novel where instead of unobtainium, the, 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 it just it just mine awareness and attention, the thing that we most are. And of course, the capitalism started out by taking life energy from people to turn it into money. So it's constantly wringing the life energy, and that means the mind, as species go extinct, as we erode the outer landscape, the inner landscape is starting to become anemic. Of course, we could all come back to life, we could revitalize it, but it, it takes a determination. We have to say, okay, that's enough of all this. Yeah, yeah. so starting to, you're right, they run out of this outer uh, landscape to, uh, to, to mine, as you say, and now are, are venturing into our inner worlds. And I think there was a... Um, it's going to be a, like a, a an advertisement that they did on one of the Super Bowls. It was a few years ago where they were trying to basically infiltrate our dreams with advertising. And uh, there was quite a hue and cry in our uh, dream community about this. It's really, <laughs> they, will they stop at nothing? And yeah. uh, I don't I don't know if it was successful, but the, even just that they had the idea that, well, we'll plant um, our you know products in your dreams is really quite frightening. Yeah. I don't know if you could, but... Maybe it's very inception like, isn't it? And you yeah. mentioned that movie and how it kind of gives us a, it, it has it's a way of the collective talking to us I, because I think that is what happens, right? We are like Jung said, we walk around acting like we've we're, we're got ideas in our head, but we're walking around in ideas. And that means that inception is happening all the time. If you live in a materialistic culture, then it's unsurprising the kinds of experiences you have. If you were to live in a different culture, that's what Plato was saying too, is even so important about the arts. Because he was saying, if the artists don't really under, if they don't have real wisdom, they won't create an ecology of insight. They will find ways that, that we might feel, oh, that was so profound or meaningful, but nothing will change the culture can still be very corrupt and have, be producing work that, okay, yeah, aesthetically, that's skillful and amazing, but but how do we relate to it? And so, sure, it must be, uh, there must be a level of inception that we don't even realize. It, it's because it's so subtle. We just think it's me and my life, as opposed to, it's like if you, the way I often think of, if, if a person has cancer, they think it's my, I have cancer, but but the culture knows how to produce it in bodies. It's gotten so good at it that it's unsurprising when people have cancer. You say, well, of course, I live in a place where that's where... So the same thing maybe with our forgetfulness of dreams or what's allowed through, it's just, okay, uh, it makes sense. But thanks to yeah. people like you, <laughs> you do the yeah. work of helping awaken, awaken us. And, yeah, and, uh, to excavate those dreams. You know, it is... It is um, uh, because the dream world is so much larger, it is, I think, um, you don't have to go very far to get outside of, of that um, infiltration or that habitual way of seeing the world. I, I've just noticed that it's, it's a very, very distinct progression that people follow when they, when they pay attention to their dreams. And it, it, because there's, the dream world is so vast that that is only the surface layer and it is, it isn't, I, I, I don't know, I could be wrong about this, but it feels like it's it's not that hard to get below it or beyond that particular influence because it isn't that thick a layer. Mm-hmm. It's it's just the um, the first thing. And beyond that, there's so much more. Mm-hmm. And it very much does become more, you know, say, participatory. I have a, a friend, Scott Sparrow, who calls this co-creative dream work where dreaming is uh, a process of, um, you know, um, part, we part, we participate in the creation of everything that we experience, but in the dream world, it it's so uh, it seems so much more obvious that that's happening because the dream we we can just think it and then it and then it it becomes different and the the the, the dream landscape can can alter so dramatically in the in the space of a short short space of time, in you know in the forest, you can certainly be uh, creating. 
um, the the landscape with you, but it doesn't change very much <laughs> as you go through it. You know, it's you have an experience of it, and it has a quality that that can be quite magical. But in dreaming, it's 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 it can just be it can you can shift from outer space to uh, underwater in you know the space of a second. So it becomes mm -hmm. very very dramatic when you when you have an experiential shift. It's very it's very clear. And it's, 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 I think it just, you know, once people get used to kind of traveling in their dream world that way, it becomes easier. And I, uh, they the, the surface layers seem to just fall away is my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, this all of course still remains relative. I mean, because we can feel a, a big shift which again might not be as much as we think. We can go down a layer and not go, have gone as far as we thought. Um, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. And at the same time, I'm still thinking, well, you can't receive, you still won't be able to receive what you're not ready for. And and there might be, I, I, I so often think of this famous uh, Tibetan yogi and scholar, a uh, total spiritual prodigy, you know, at age five was reading and writing Sanskrit and just incredible and um, revered as a, as a practitioner and a scholar. But then still, after e even being this famous person, he finally, he actually has a dream. And in the dream, uh, there are these very cosmic level beings who are there um, and uh, so Buddhist philosophy is funny because uh, they the, the gods are not as uh, a big a deal as a Buddha because gods are, are just another kind of delusion. <laughs> They're so, but it allows for these uh, kind of cosmic beings, gods and other kinds of beings. And there are some beings who have really practiced deeply. And so they're kind of like a special form of an enlightened Buddha kind of figure. So I think it was Manjushri who is the the awakening being of wisdom. He embodies wisdom, and uh, I think it was Manjushri. And Manjushri was holding this book, and he points at the, uh, a particular line. And Sankapa woke up, and then he went and he had that book on his shelf, and he opened it up and he looked at it, and suddenly, the scales had really once and for all fallen away. And this is a person who had, had you know, all these experiences, which is absolutely revered. And he said, it was the exact opposite of what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in this whole time, and he, his final realization is, yeah, all of that was just wrong. And it's interesting because when there are these stories of when Buddha, like when Buddha was in the forest and he woke up, he supposedly, one of the things he said is, I and all beings have entered nirvana. And it touches on that sense of the instantaneous shift that he he experienced everything as having had a incredible, inconceivable, literally in not conceivable shift. And then there's a, this a wonderful scene when uh, he's talking to this other fellow who is say, thinking like the world is kind of crappy. And he's like, man, it's so hard to get enlightened here, you know? I mean, we have all this stuff and there's, you know, it's challenging. You got this human body you have to deal with. And so then Buddha touches his toe on the ground. And at that moment, everything is like shining and luminous. And everybody gets this glimpse of how he just could instantaneously experience the shift. And then they're brought back again, you know, to the regular thing. So they're not enlightened, but they get a little I'm going to taste of what it would be like. Yeah, big, big <laughs> shift. But mm -hmm. the dreams are magical in that way, though, as you're, you're saying, they, they show us the the unbelievable fluidity that is going on. Because when we look at the tree, we don't think that it is changing even, but the, the tree is. It's like if we could somehow see the tree as a pattern of impermanence, we would say, wow, it's alive and it's moving. And I don't have much else to say. You can resonate with that. But I, <laughs> I'm just picturing how we're in the forest and it's like to say, that if we saw it like a dream, even though it would seem to have more stability than some dreams we have, that it still actually is very dreamlike. Mm -hmm. That makes yeah. sense. It does make sense. I feel that sometimes it depends. I think, you know, that idea of having three or four days out there is, is something that, that resonates for me because I, I think when I first go out in the out in the woods for a walk it's not like a 
it feels all that different. I can I can say that I like it out there and my mind can be free. Yeah. But after a um a longer time, it 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 all seems to be like um like clearer and more um I don't have the right words for it. I can just say it as the quality is different. I can feel the space around me in a different way. I can feel like that. Yeah. The um my relative size to the to the whole the whole everything and it's 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 being without all of the um extraneous input and yeah. true silence i like I, i've gone and done some you know trips up into the yukon and paddled down rivers where there's just really when you when you stop there's true silence not just silence like you can hear a distant plane or but actual quiet mm. and I, I feel like that is um such a rare thing to be able to experience and mm. it really does you can touch into the vastness and that feels closer to dreaming that kind of out, outdoor experience because mm. dreaming has that space it yeah. has so much uh, room and i mean I, I it's funny i i do all this writing and treating nightmares and i don't have nightmares my dreams are very uh they're they're very cosmic dreams i do often have dreams of just being in infinite space and not even being there like my I don't have a dream ego in a lot of times in my dreams so I I, I think I probably have an unusual experience of dreaming so I, I describe mm -hmm. dreams in this way but I don't think everyone experiences it quite the same way as I do so mm -hmm. uh, I can I can say that they don't because I, I sit with a lot of dreams and and um, but there is that potential always I think in in dreaming and and yeah, I think you're saying in, in life itself as well, but it's harder to find. I feel like I have to go very far out there to find it in, in waking life. Yeah, of course, meditation is very much like that. I mean, that's um, it's the, the Zen phrase is thundering silence, a silence that's so unbelievable that it it's it's like a clap of thunder to you because it's and that it's not in opposition to sound, but it is the origin of relative sound and relative silence that we tend to experience. And so that's one place. And also, of course, then uh, when you engage in uh, uh, lucid dreams and dream yoga, you're also getting the kind of different orientation toward it allows you to, if you wanted to, let the dream unfold in those cosmic directions. I mean, the, some of the one one way of doing dream yoga practice is to uh, live multiple lifetimes in a dream so that you you allow yourself to die, you allow your body to get old in the dream, die, go into the bardo, which is the between. And that's interesting, of course, because there are six, I mean, everything's a between. You and I are in a between right now, but there's the, the bardo of dreaming, the between of dreaming, the between of dying, the reality between and between in the womb, and then meditation is a between, and then this life is a between generally. But you go into the, the, the these different bardos and you you go back through, <laughs> and uh, so it's really interesting how we have that access, potentially with the right kind of practice. Do you when dream you, like that? Do you do have I, uh, dreams that go that that far? I've never died. I have been able to uh, go from being awake into letting the body fall asleep and then seeing everything go dark. And you do. I feel like if you read the um, the the book on liberation in hearing, um, in the between, that's that we call the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Obviously, they wouldn't call it that. <laughs> We're Tibetans, but anyway. <laughs> so, but yeah. so it's it's the book of on of liberation upon hearing in the between because someone is speaking it to you and you're in this between. But they describe like the elements and what it feels like for the body to die. And I I've experienced some of those elements sort of shifting as you go from conscious to unconscious then everything is dark and then the dream opens up as if i always feel uh, like it's like the holodeck on the uh, enterprise like suddenly whoom, everything is there and you're aware that you just made this and that it's really cool like someone flipped a switch whoosh, and there's a scene and you don't know what the scene's going to be and then it's there and so I've experienced that a few times. I haven't been able to die yet, other than the, the sort of experiences in meditation, which are the tradition teaches are like dying for various reasons, right? Mm -hmm. But um, 
I think there are very advanced practitioners. I mean, it's a difference between some of these advanced yogis and and how we have to have that humility that we don't realize what kind of mind is possible for us um, because we're we just have this habitual mind and we don't realize how out of kilter it can be and how unskillful and lacking sensitivity it can be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you've yeah. been in the bardo of dying oh, many you? times yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes i have yeah yeah i think that part might be partly why my dreams have the characteristics they do and i dream a lot about that um yeah. that state i think it's it's partly because it was it sounds like a bad experience but it wasn't yeah well, it's often not. I mean, it sometimes is, but but what is referred to as a, a near death experience, or I mean, as people are sometimes changing that now, but um, a post mortem experience, or I don't know. But uh, you know, it's very often that it's a, a positive overall for you. It was. Yeah, I well, I was born um, two months premature, so I I feel like I arrived in an in between state. I lived in an in-between state right yeah. from the get-go, and I think yeah. that might have colored my life experience quite a bit. Um, more than I would have realized as I was growing up, I just notice um, now, especially in dreams and um, my interest in them and my comfort level with certain certain states that I think that must have been kind of just familiar to me. And then, and I nearly drowned. I wrote this in my book, I believe. I wrote mm-hmm. about nearly drowning when I was 17. and and feeling like um, I got to a point of of acceptance at, you know, that, okay, I really did think I was dying and I didn't, um, I didn't, I felt oh, just a beautiful um, sensation of, of, of belonging that I have never felt the same in my, in my waking life. Mm. And I wasn't, I never lost consciousness, but I did. And I did really um, think, oh my goodness, my poor mother, I I really, I really can't do this. Um, My sister and my mother, I really thought I can't do this. I can't leave them right now. But I didn't feel for myself like it was a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And and then I've dreamt about that in various forms uh, many, many times. And, And then also gone into waking dream states and lucid dream states where these things are all overlapping Mm -hmm. and it's hard to put into words, but I, I do, I do feel like it gives me this uh, fearlessness uh, that, Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have had otherwise Uh, Mm -hmm. willingness to go into, uh, you know, the different realms and with other people in their dreams as well. I have a confidence that I think comes from all that experience Mm -hmm. that I didn't, I didn't cultivate, I didn't meditate. I just ended up in these extreme experiences that, that put me there and I, I'm grateful for it. I really feel like it's made me uh, wiser, deeper than I would have been otherwise. Mm-hmm. That's quite an affirmation of, of, of life in general. And uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, again, mine hasn't, hasn't been, I haven't had a, near de- a dying experience in the dream world well of course i think maybe no i don't think i actually died and came back to life in a dream nor have i had too many like i certainly didn't have a post-mortem experience like you had only through spiritual practice have i ever had the thought i think i might die and like you i thought of my poor mother oh i don't know i sh- probably shouldn't do this what would she think? but um but it, it I, that really can be so helpful in in so many ways, like even just just think thinking how it draws us back. There's there's a literature around this. How brushes with death are very they have very similar effects to spiritual practice. I mean, I still encourage people who have them to engage in spiritual practice, and sometimes that's, that is what happens. I mean, I know a fellow whose whole life changed because of a, a brush with death. He really thought, okay, this might be it, and then you know, next thing you know, he's at a Zen monastery, and um, it, it, there is something that's so um, so nice about the you could say the soul getting our attention that way because we could try to rationalize and say yes you dove in the water and you didn't know what was going and we could also say well you know the soul's more subtle than that Jung might be willing to say well you never know 
uh, it arranged this experience so that you could see something that you really needed to see to do the work that you were going to do in this life. And there's that the image on the cover kind of depicts it in a way because there's this, when you, okay. if you if those of you who go get the book you see there's a woman diving into the water, which is yeah. where Dr. Leslie began yeah. diving into that water, and not yes, being able the to cold come water. up. <laughs> yeah, the cold water. Yeah, yeah. and being uh, comfortable there. It's almost like that's. Uh, that that you you maybe the journey into the psyche is diving into the water and realizing that you can still breathe under there, mm-hmm. and um, you know that, that that you'll be okay, and that's what it means to enter the deep waters of the psyche to say, oh, okay, I don't have to, I can breathe down here. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that um, most of my lucid dreams start that way. I'm underwater, and then I'm then I realize I'm breathing, or I don't need to breathe, and then I realize. Yeah. Oh, I'm. This is a dream. Wow! Look and, at uh, that. Isn't that interesting? That that it did. Be, it became like a uh, your medicine stone and your medicine bag. You know, you've you've got that. But at the same time, it still also didn't. It, there can be the sense that everything's okay, but again, the ego isn't quite done with everything, and there are parts because you then later had a therapeutic experience that was important from that. It wasn't mm-hmm. like, uh, and I th- I think that's so interesting that you. You, you you tell your story about being <laughs> about that oh my yeah. Little, um, that, I, I um yeah I well the dream that I that I write about in my book is a, is a hybrid of it's like I'm in a, a glass box and right. uh, like the incubator and it's being a sucked down a, a whirlpool which is like where I nearly drown right and they so it it, it pushes puts those two near death experiences into one. And there's a sense of um, of being um, pulled down to the bottom, and and that you know that there's really nobody there, and you know I reach up and there isn't anybody there, and this is I I, I feel like this is partly a memory of what it was like when I was born because mm-hmm. I was in that born in that era of, of germ phobic you, you know new new n- newborns um, preemies weren't held like they are now. I really make a point of holding those babies and making sure that they're, they get that touch, but I didn't. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, it was with a, a, with the, a Jungian therapist and it's my, my point of it is uh, of, of telling the story in the book was because the dream by itself was not therapeutic, but the, um, the therapist who was, who was very, um, you know, strict with the frame of the time and, um, you know, wouldn't ever dream of touching me. It, when I, 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 he asked me to reenact this dream or go back into it and reach out. And then he actually grabbed my hand and, and um, so, you know, and, and looked me in the eye and just gave me this physical sense of, yes, somebody is here. And it was shocking, um, first of all, because in the dream, I wasn't expecting it. But also in life, I was, I was like, wow, this is, this, is, <laughs> this is not something that you would normally do. And it was, it was quite a, um, uh, it, just, it just rocked my, my body it just because it was a, such an unexpected shock. And it really, it really shifted something for me and in in my sense of um aloneness it it, it shifted that i'm, I'm a, you know still somewhat of a lone wolf but i i feel like that experience of being met where i wasn't expecting anyone to to be there was just a profoundly helpful thing and the dream brought me the situation but not necessarily the solution so yeah um to bring that dream like that to somebody who's a gifted therapist like this man um was um yeah, it was just a, such a, it made it into a powerfully positive and, and you know, really deeply um, moving experience that that shifted something. I don't know how else I would have gotten to that, that mm. material, you know, that sensation. Mm. I really feel like that was, um, the dream was a gift, but it's like, if I hadn't done that, it would be like a gift I didn't open, you know? Yeah, yeah. And there too, it's that ecology of mind. Because when we come back from the dream, or whatever the experience was, we're we're back in the habitual mind, whether we like it or not. Unless we think we've become totally enlightened or something, then you know you're back to there's habits and they're pulling you back. And and the whole point of a dream is that the larger ecology of mind can know things that the smaller ecology of mind can't. And that's why we have to have you know community. That's why Jesus said, "Where any two of you." meet there also am i and same thing in the buddhist tradition you have the the three jewels which are the the realized teacher the teachings that help you become realized and then the community 
And same thing with Plato's Academy, community, and uh, the love relationship. Bit, you know that that being support, feeling a caring, compassionate relationship allows you to think things that you can't think otherwise. So it's really uh, that's also so affirming of of therapeia when one is there to attend to your soul, and even that's the nature of love, isn't it? That we learn how to attend to the soul of our beloved because we want them to be able to have those insights that lead them to feel happier and freer and more themselves or what you know whatever that might mean. It's a tricky thing, but um, yeah, that's that's very. Um, it reminds me very much of focusing this um, idea from from Jen Lin's focusing. He talks about how this line, which I don't remember exactly, but something about be, that being the ability to only truly be myself when I'm with you. That there's a way that being um, um, felt, being seen, uh, the interaction adds more and makes it possible. To, to go beyond um, what you would be able to if the person wasn't with you or wasn't listening in a certain way. It's a, it's a quality of presence. It's not just being with someone, but being with someone with that quality of presence Absolutely. that brings um, brings more. It brings um, the, you know, the, your more authentic expression forward, I think. Yeah, well, if we are if we are relationality through and through, not a bunch of objects that are in relationships, but if there's only relationality, then of course that's the way it is, and you have to learn how to enter those larger ecologies of mind, whether we call those helpers from other dimensions, or um, we can hear the trees, or 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 it's with somebody there. Um, yeah, Socrates too, you know, had this idea. We we go along. We're each on our own two feet, but we're together. And that we feel stronger and more stable because of that. Yeah, that's really, uh, that's knowing ourselves in a different way and knowing the world in a different way. What is the activity? What is the proper way to know self and world? And Buber, Martin Buber realized that too, you know, because he had that sense that the, uh, the I-U relationship, which you can have with a tree or a stone, is still, that is calling forth the divine to be there and kind of illuminate more than you could on your own. Mm. I thou, he said. I thou. I you. It, it, it can he said, do. I you really? Yeah. Well, Walter Kaufman pointed that out because okay, the Buber family. I, maybe I read it wrong. <laughs> no, they. Well, what he pointed out is that is that other translators made it thou, but it was not. It was intimate, but it was, of course, supposed to be reverential. But it, but if uh, I like Walter Kaufman as a thinker and and as a human being, he really was a person with a lot of integrity. And people are criticizing some of his translation choices, but I still prefer to read his versions of Nietzsche and Buber. But he he the Buber family asked him to do it, and in his introduction, he talks about that that it is ich den du, which would be familiar in German, and uh, but it's reverential. It's a reverential you. So it's kind of, he's inviting us to see it. And that's why people used I and thou, because they were emphasizing that it was somehow reverential, but it, it really is also so intimate. Like he felt the thou made it seem like it was too far away. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I, I would like to talk about focusing. Maybe we'll do that in another dialogue. I had a feeling that there'd be so much to say about dreams. And I want to just have a few more minutes to let you say whatever else you think is important. I mean, focusing is interesting to me for those of you who will hopefully tune in, tune in again. Maybe you'll be seeing this one. Dr. Leslie and I have another one up there. Uh, it, since it was developed in part by a philosopher and he was working as a therapist, therapeia, I see it as the activity of therapeia. I see that as more like what I think philosophy is than what he thought. We, di we differ on what philosophy is a little bit because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he's a little bit like he thinks it's the manufacture of concepts. He sort of says that in different places, that the philosophy is the creation of concepts. I don't think that's quite the way I see it, but that's okay because I respect people who do that work. I think it's really interesting. Okay, but, but just uh, about dreams, what would you like us to know that we didn't touch on or what what haven't you been able to say you've, you've i think you've done a few interviews and this book is so cool again i really recommend it to people she takes you through the steps of how you would work with a dream she takes you through different views on what dreams are different therapeutic orientations with examples i mean it's just there's a lot there in a not super long book i think it's 150 something pages with hmm. you know um 
super easy, clear to read, easy to read. I don't mean like you're, you're, sim you're, you're you, it's just good. You did such a good job. Oh, thank but you. But what would you like to say um, that you haven't said or, or that you have said before and you want us to think about or? Mm. Wow, open ended. Um, I would say, you know, because part of, a big part of the reason I wrote this book and, and talk about dreams so much is because they have been such a gift to me and also a gift to me in my work with clients. And um, if you're, whether you're a therapist or not, I, I guess the, you know, the, the, the thing I want to get across is that, um, you know, dreams are to not dismiss them. First of all, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people are really find their dreams disturbing and, and really prefer to dismiss them. But I feel like the, the, um, the attitude that you bring to them colors your relationship with them. And so if you're afraid of your dreams, they become scary. And if you love your dreams, they become loving and they respond to you. And, and, and even like my dream of, of drowning, I, I could have gone, wow, that's a horrible dream. And that reminded me of when I nearly died. And I could have just, you know, closed the book and went, I just, wow, that was awful. And I didn't have that attitude. I um, think it partly was because that near death experience was so um, actually loving, but it, it also was just a, by way of example, I went, I turned toward that dream and saw it, even though it was a technically a nightmare, it woke me up, it woke me up um, as being pulled under and, 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 and I was definitely frightened. I, I looked at it as a, oh, this is a memory of that. This is something important. It's really trying to get my attention. And I turned to it. If, if you can't love it, at least be curious and calm. And then you'll find that your dream will meet you there. And if you can, you'll get so much out of them. They will, they will um, meet you. And I, I can't say enough about how much they've enriched my life and my practice. And so I hope you turn toward your dreams as opposed to away from them if you have a, a tendency to avoid them mm. for that. that. And I hope that if there are any therapists listening to hear that encouragement of, of that this is a powerful way to work and you demonstrate that again and again, your own personal example is a, a, a we, we just touched on of really that experience of working with something helped you and, and shifted something experientially in a way that is deep and profound and that you really appreciate. It's also wonderful to hear you express. I I, I always say that Sophia or the soul, however you want to think of that, uh, she doesn't, doesn't bring something that she doesn't believe you can handle. So something in us thinks we can handle, even, even the thing that the ego is saying, I can't handle that. And um, I think that's part of what you're saying is, no, it's appearing there because it wants to help you. And if you were to say, oh, I think this is help, it might look scary at first, but that you even had the experience that so many people have of this, it's as if there's something so loving at the base of everything that even your near-death experience was, wow, there's still something loving here. And this dream that scared me, but it's still something loving there somehow that wants me to grow and knows that I can, has so much confidence in me. And then you met that confidence, all right, because you have it in you, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, that's uh, so good. And just how important it must be for people to begin to try to listen so we can recover this. I also wonder, it's something like, this is partly the thinking of the world and how the world thinks itself forward. That might be what's dis, dis um, unbalancing about it, or or feels a little weird because we're thinking the thinking that the world thinks. Uh, I, I Bateson did a really good job about this. He said, you know, there's a syllogism in Barbara, and that is uh, the syllogism in Barbara is all humans are uh, are mortal. Socrates is a human. Socrates is going to die. Socrates is mortal. And that's clear. He said, but then there's a syllogism. He calls it the syllogism in grass. Uh, uh, human beings die. Grass dies. Human beings are grass. And he said, that's the way the world thought human beings into existence. 
and uh, the, and so dreams because they're like that and art because it's like that and spiritual practices because they they either create that through ceremony or or internal experiences as your life unfolds you start to enter the thinking of the world which just isn't quite like our ordinary human thinking but you can get good at it you could begin to think the world forward in a more vitalizing way and maybe studying dreams in that spirit to understand that this is how the world's trying to think your soul forward and to think the whole thing forward, to create it forward, is a part of what we learn from them. Yeah, I, I think that's so beautifully put. And I do believe that's that's what dreams are are doing, is like nudging us forward and not trying to hurt us. They're 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 not coming to make us miserable. They're mm -hmm. Are coming to us in from a, a a larger place and inviting us to you know become larger ourselves by yeah. engaging with them. Their language is not. You're right. It's not the same as our everyday language. It's very. Uh, I think it might be why people see them as so um, nonsensical, but they're not really at all nonsensical. They're just right. metaphorical and bigger and images and. And I don't know. I mean, I actually don't know beyond that. There, there's still there's still a great mystery, which I love about dreams. Yeah, but it's like the difference between the activity. Krishnamurti makes that uh, a, a discernment between thought and thinking. And, and he would say that habitual things you're used to, that's thought, because it's a pattern that you're just actually repeating with very little. So it's like the syllogism in Barbara. You do it again and again and again. I had a crappy day. I'm going to have a drink. I drank too much. I woke up. I had a crappy day. I'm going to have a drink. And so you're just stuck in in this pattern. And he would say thinking is the alive activity. And he would say you discover it in meditation. But I think he would all agree that you could discover it in dreams, that that, that is a, an alive thinking. And you you sense then that the world is nonlinear, interwoven, associative, magical, uh, dynamic, and um, that it's not a bunch of objects, but it's a, it's relation, a dance of relationality that you can receive guidance from and and live the world forward from yes and anything can happen from there anything, yeah right? it's like there's no limit to what's possible in in the dream world yeah now you you just a final thing too but because i feel like i'm trying to encourage everybody to think about this but you do specifically talk about the patience that we would need and that as a therapist you, you don't you don't just try to stick one of these into a session. Could you say a little bit about that? Um, you know, what kind of time? I, I mean, I think, gosh, this it's a hard thing because I know what it's like. You know, we're all so busy, and I think that's part of the deal here. We're being kept busy. You know, we're supposed to have the robots working by now. Now it's like we're afraid the robots are going to take our jobs. They're going to take our jobs. No, they're supposed to, so you have more time to dream. Yes. Or we just need to stop doing some of the dumb jobs we do that take away from time to to dream um how does anything happen people are dreaming the world forward right so but okay just let's be honest about what you think is appropriate time and and for um you mean working with with people yeah. who bring dreams to therapy yeah. mm -hmm. um well when people um i mean what what happens is that i partly the dreams take care of this because the um of the, the nature of memory and remembering dreams that we talked about so it seems like when there's a, um, images or, or experiences that people are ready for, their dreams will become more vivid and they'll remember them. And then within that, you know what, it, it seems like there's a progression. It depends where the person is in their own, um, say, personal development or what their, where their interests lie. Because if they're in a place where they're, you know, very much interested in, solving their waking life problems, their dreams will be mostly about that. They won't have necessarily, they will have a spiritual dimension because they all do. But if you're trying to um, pull that from a dream when someone's really just up against life um, difficulties, then they're not going to, they're not going to engage with it. They're not going to enjoy it. And they will, um, yeah, they will probably be not interested, but it, it's, it's like meeting the, person where they're at with the dream they bring uh, figuring out with them what they think i always ask someone immediately 
when they have a dream, what did you make of it? What's what's your sense of this dream? And and I'll use that as a gauge to say, okay, we'll enter it here. And uh, and then you have to also assess their ability to engage with experiencing, mm -hmm. to actually be with the dream. And I never, I never sit with a dream and try and figure out what it means. And mm -hmm. so um, that that isn't something that I feel is is very fruitful. But I will. People have varying levels of of ability to sit with experiencing directly. And so I think of it like. Um, I think this is a Buddhist term of touch and go, but also in in um, in learning to fly a uh, plane, you 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 land and then take off again, and so um, it's a little bit like that about just dipping into experience and seeing how um, how much tolerance a person has for that because it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that um, that first dream, um, it really just see how it goes, and 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 when somebody feels um, like they're flowing with it, you can just carry on. And I always start with finding helpful places in dreams, resources in dreams and embodying those so that the experience is loving and that they're my first, um, mission is really just, um, to, to show them how loving and helpful a dream can be mm. and develop a relationship with dreaming itself mm -hmm. and then see what, the next dream brings see if they bring another dream they may never bring another dream they make oh boy that's that's too much that's usually yeah. not what happens but see what the, the how the dream answers and yeah. that will tell you and the dreams will kind of guide you mm. um so it's 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 um it's about like starting with dipping your toe in the water and seeing if, it, if it's um inviting or yeah not, trying to keep it um keeping it at a level that feels inviting and doable and supportive yeah. So that's an important thing for people to keep in mind is that with the with right approach, what you'll find is even in a difficult dream, you'll find resources that are strengthening right immediately, let alone what the deeper, and that there's a difference between a deep meaningfulness and a meaning that we could write down. You know, so obviously I, I, to, to, to draw on um, Socrates would would laugh at the question, "What's the meaning of life?" That's because he's touched the the deep meaningfulness that the, it it has shifted him. And so there is an insight there, but it's not one that you say, "Well, this is the meaning of the dream." But insight did come, and it it was healing and transformative in nature, because I could be in the meaningfulness. And that's a weird distinction, and it's it's subtle, but I it's very practical. It's it's those things where we say, "Oh, I see." something has changed and, and yeah, you're guiding people to, to that. Yeah. yeah. There's a shift, a, a, an entering into the, a dream shifting from, Oh, this is just a mystery. This is nonsensical to a, an aha moment. I, a, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I feel it's feeling into, I feel what this is about. And, and yes. then having the insight is, is I think a byproduct of the, of that shift, not a, not a goal in itself, but when mm -hmm. insight drops in, you know, Oh, there's been a shift. That's right. And yes. so it's it's finding the the recognition. You know, there's a there's a it, it's like a recognition in a dream. I feel how that's speaking to me, and it, yes. it can be anything. It can be anything. It's a, often just what someone needs to to sense or know. Right. Um. So and it's See, I, I, sorry. I was no, just going to no. say it's not easy. This is artful. I, I guess yes. that you know it's and. And the, the book is very much like a step-by-step, -step, like a primer. If you know nothing about dream work, you can go through. And it's 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 very, as you're saying, easy to read. It's not meant to be difficult. It's it's a way to 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 venture in without feeling overwhelmed by it. But once you start, it does become artful. It becomes a a way of listening that you yes. develop by doing it. Right. I, I, what's interesting too, again, there. See, knowledge depends on our way of knowing. We think there's there's just knowledge. And so, if you say what's the what's the meaning of the dream, you're asking to well, well to tell me what I need to know or what it's telling me. But but then if we if that's going to depend on the process we use, then then there isn't a, a pre existing thing that we find. So then on an, another level, Plato would would take that idea. I think is what he's telling us is knowledge depends on then the knower if you're not the kind of person who could know a certain thing 
then you just won't be able to know it. When you become that person, in other words, when the shift, when you shift, then the knowledge can arrive because you changed what you are actually, which also touches on my the whole suggestion I had before, which is that the dream is making us. It's asking us to be made anew. And if we could become the kind of person that it's inviting us to, then it will grant the insight because it says, oh, you changed. Now you can have this. Here's the thing. And it might have been all kinds of things that could have been available depending on what you became. And then that shows too that miracle that we were talking about, that you're watching the impermanence. You're not. There's not a client there. There's a patterning of impermanence. It's a thing that's just flowing and doesn't even see itself as flowing. Yet it's me. I'm telling yes. you my dream. But no. And if they enter that dynamism and let it inform them, then something could happen because I became different with your care, your support. Yes. And they yeah. can't go back either. That's yes. That. Once yeah. you know something, you can't not. Yes, yes. Although, I mean, that's I would put a caveat on that, though, because the thing is that spiritual materialism is very powerful, mm -hmm. and even powerful experiences can become a memory if we don't keep practicing our life. I mean, we'll remember the memory, but but the wisdom traditions do teach us we have to keep the practice going, because they almost all of them have this place where they say, they're, 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 you still can backslide. You know, you could have had a really big Satori thing happen, and then two weeks later, you're having an affair with somebody, and it's all you know a big scandal. Mm -hmm. So I understand yeah, what no, you I mean. No, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean more specifically this: if you yeah. if you have a felt shift uh, with, yeah. in response to a dream image that moves you, and you feel into a situation in a way that you didn't before. Yeah. You're not going to go back to how you were because you can't. Yeah. Yeah, Once you yeah. have that um, shift, it doesn't, it, it can't be erased. Yes, you can go back to all your bad habits and all of those things, but yes. that particular shift won't. Yeah, yeah that it, insight. It, it, does, yeah. it sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so, so many good things. I, I really uh, have such a deep appreciation for what you, what you do. I also want to put one last plug in for compassion practice. All you dream workers of all kinds, dreamers too. Uh, especially maybe the dreamers, but all of us, just the, the compassion practice can be so much of what changes the kind of person, the kind of pattern of impermanence you are and could really open you up to um, exploring things that you might not have known that you could explore. It's such a good foundation because it gives the kind of feeling of lovingness that you had so viscerally in your life and allows people to touch it for themselves. So maybe uh, dream, more dreamers. We should do, write uh, together an article on compassion and dream work maybe one yes, day. But we'll yes, talk about focusing <laughs> next time too. Okay. I would like that. It was really yes, lovely to to have some dialogue with you. So, so, uh, such good work. And thank you so much for your book, for your work, for your practice of life. Mm, you're welcome. Thanks for this conversation. It's been It's been a treat. Yeah, same here. And thanks to all of you. Thanks for joining us here. If you have questions, reflections, dreams you'd like to share, you can send them in through dangerouswisdom.org. Might be able to bring some of them into a future contemplation. Until then, this is Dr. Nikos reminding you that your soul and the soul of the world are not two things. Take good care of them.